Így van, Ádám, már itt is van a Skype vonal túlsó végén uh, professzor Avi Leib a Harvard Egyetemről. Uh, dear professor Leib, thank you so much for accepting uh, our invitation for this talk and uh, we are really, really amazing, we're thrilled that you're here online with us on the show uh, tonight and it is really a tremendous honor indeed to, ha to have you here on Parallaxis. And uh, well, among so many, many other things, you are also an author of the best-selling New York Times bestseller, right? It is. It's a New York Times bestseller uh, book called Extraterrestrial, which is now also available in Hungarian as well, uh, published by Agave, and it is now even online. So I know that you folks, you can't go out because of the restrictions and the bookstores are closed, but you can still get your copy. And this is indeed a fascinating book, uh, totally but uh, somehow provocative, to say the least, because what it states is nothing less than this uh, object, let's call it that way, Oumuamua, that was discovered in 2017 by the Penstars 2 telescope, may well be an interstellar messenger uh, that, that is a, an artificial object. And you came to this conclusion, of course, uh, and, and, well, please first remind our listeners uh, your, to your train of thought that actually led you to this uh, r rather radical conclusion, please. Well, thank you first for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure and uh, I wish uh, once the pandemic uh, is over, I wish to uh, visit Hungary. Um, I heard it's a beautiful country. And uh, with respect to this object that was discovered in 2017, uh, it was the first uh, object from outside the solar system that was spotted near Earth. Uh, and it was given the name Oumuamua by the uh, people who discovered it because it was, it, it means a scout in the Hawaiian language. Um, and the, this object looked uh, unusual in many ways. At first astronomers thought maybe it's a, a, a comet, but it didn't show any cometary tail. There was no gas or dust around it the way comets show. Uh, and uh, then, so it was definitely not a comet. Then uh, uh, from the reflection of sunlight from it, it was uh, inferred that it, it, it is mostly, most likely pancake shaped, flat, uh, with a very extreme uh, geometry projected on the sky, at least 10 times longer than wide when projected on the sky as it was tumbling. Uh, and then it showed an excess push away from the sun by a force that uh, in addition to the sun's gravity, a force that declines inversely with distance squared in a very smooth fashion. And it couldn't be accounted for by the rocket effect because there was no gas evaporating from it. Uh, and so that was very mysterious, what gives it the extra push. And the only thing that came to my mind is reflection of sunlight. It would behave exactly that way. And actually in September 2020, there was a new object discovered, this one bound to the sun, roughly at the orbit of the Earth, and uh, by the same telescope, PANSTARS, and uh, the astronomers inferred that this object that was named 2020 SO actually came from the Earth. It was a rocket booster that was launched in 1966. Uh, and uh, it showed also an excess push away from the sun without a cometary tail before the objects knew its identity. Uh, and so, um, in this case, we know that the object had very thin walls it, and it was hollow, and that's why uh, the reflection of sunlight gave it the push. And we know that we made it artificially. The question is, who made Oumuamua? <laughs> Indeed, yes, but 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 of course uh, you also mentioned this pancake shape or something like that, which is of course just a, a simplest guess because it assumes that, for example, its albedo is homogeneous, right? So it also can be that it is something like, uh, for example, Saturn's uh, satellite I Iapetus, right, which has a a bright side and the dark side. So, so what I want to point out to, to, to our listeners that the, in this particular case, it's extremely hard to say anything because what we see is just a point of light, right? So it's right. one pixel. It's, it's not resolved. Uh, the only thing is we see a point of light with varying uh, brightness. And the, the brightness reflects the fact that the object was reflecting sunlight and it, as it was tumbling, the, the area that is projected on the sky changed by a factor of 10, which is very extreme. We don't see that for 
typical uh, asteroids, uh, usually it's up to a factor of two change in the brightness. And uh, the reflection of sunlight can be effective only if the object is very thin, uh, less than a millimeter or so. And that mm -hmm. led me to, to conclude that it may be a sail uh, that is pushed by light, a sort of a light sail. Nature doesn't produce light sails. And so that's why I concluded that it, it, it may be artificial in origin. Mm -hmm. And as you uh, indicated, the, the best way to tell is actually to take a photograph. Uh, so next time we see an object that is as weird as this one, and you know it should happen within the next few years because uh, the Pan-STARRS telescope surveyed the sky only for a few years and found this object. So it, it's unlikely that it was a privileged time. That hmm. it's most most likely we will find it again and again. Objects like it. You know, when I go to the kitchen and I find an ant, I usually get alarmed because there must be many more ants out there. So uh, in the same way, uh, once we find another object that looks as weird, doesn't look like a comet or an asteroid, uh, we can fly uh, a camera close to it so that it will take a close-up photograph. And, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. In my case, a picture is worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book. <laughs> that's right and it's of course not a surprise at all that this comes from you this idea because you're also on on the board of this uh, uh, breakthrough starshot enterprise if i'm not mistaken that exactly aims to do precisely this to send a, a small light say to to one of the nearby stars and of course uh, it also comes to my mind that, of course, we we hope we are hopeful that we will see again something like Oumuamua. But uh, uh, do you think it would be feasible actually to use the breakthrough Starshot uh, system to catch it, to catch oh, this yeah, this this very object? Definitely, if we had the technology already developed, it would have been an ideal use of it because. Uh, each spacecraft, um, in in the case of breakthrough Starshot, would be equipped with a camera and navigation device, communication device, and it, the goal is to reach a fraction of the speed of light. And this object was moving at uh, one part in 10,000 of the speed of light, uh, a percent of a percent. So it would have been very easy to catch up with it. However, yeah. with existing rockets, we barely could catch up. We cannot catch up with it uh, almost. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. That's clear that we would have catched it. But my question is whether in the future are there plans to catch this particular okay. Oumuamua in, in the future? OK, so this object is now a million times fainter than it was close to Earth. And as a result, it's impossible to track it with telescopes. And we don't know precisely the orbit well enough to send something that will catch up with it. But what I'm saying is we don't need to obsess with this object because there, there, there must be many more like it, given the fact that over a period of a few years, we detected one. And so we should focus on finding more and then getting as much data as possible. So for example, if we take a picture and it looks unusual, it doesn't look like a natural object, the next step would be maybe to land on it. And if, you know, we could perhaps read a label made on planet X, or we can uh, study the technology and import it to Earth. You know, if this technology is a million times, a million years more advanced than the one we have right now, then importing it to Earth would bring great benefits. So uh, all, all together, I advocate for space archaeology. You know, uh, yeah. in the past, we searched for technological civilizations by looking for radio signals. Uh, in the last four, 70 years or so, but in order to get, uh, I mean, it's just like having a phone conversation. In order to have a conversation, you need the counterpart to be alive. But uh, we cannot have a phone conversation with the Mayans. The Mayan culture is gone. We can still find how they lived from the relics they left behind and that we can trace from archaeological digs. So we can, in, in much the same way, look for civilizations that are not around anymore, that are dead by now, you know, that sent uh, spacecrafts like uh, Voyager 1, Voyager 2, New Horizons into space a billion years ago. You know, most of the, most, most of the stars are much uh, formed much earlier than the sun, billions of years before the sun. So if they had a technological civilization like ours, uh, the relics are already in space. And we can search for them just like looking for plastic bottles on the beach, you know, among all the rocks that are there. Every now and then you find a plastic bottle that tells you there was a civilization around. That's right. So 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 you may 
do, do you agree or what do you think about uh, whether it is possible that the solution for the Fermi's paradox could be that the civilizations don't meet because because they are short-lived yes. by a natural law? What yeah, do you think I, I about discuss, it? Uh, I discuss it in my book and it's called The Great Filter and indeed this is a very plausible scenario, given the fact that, you know, we are not taking good care of our planet and we develop technologies that would lead to our, uh, could lead to our peril. Uh, and so um, uh, another possibility is that, you know, the, uh, we, we are not interesting enough for anyone to visit us. You know, when I met my wife, she had a lot of friends that were waiting for a prince charming on a white horse to make them a marriage proposal. And that never came. And so why do we feel that we, are, uh, we deserve attention, that we are uh, privileged to, to have a visit? You know, I don't think that we are intelligent enough. Uh, it's presumptuous of us to believe that, you know, we, we will sit here and see someone coming over and looking at us. And um, we, we probably are very common, you know, things like us are very common or were common in the past. Uh, because half of the sun-like stars have a planet the size of the Earth, roughly at the same separation. We know that from the Kepler satellite now. And so not only we are not at the center of the universe, like Aristotle advocated, also our environment, uh, you know, the Earth-Sun system is not unusual by any means. And therefore, if you arrange for similar circumstances, you might as well get similar outcomes around other stars. And therefore, you know, it, we, we might be just like, an ant on, on a sidewalk, you know, there are many ants out there. And when you walk down the street, you don't pay attention to every ant. And so why do that? Why would anyone pay attention to us? You know, if you look at the morning news, we are not particularly intelligent. We are doing terrible things. Yeah, that's correct. Now, OK, the, the, that's fine. And, and, and of course, this whole argument is, is totally exciting. But what I also have on my office wall literally fra framed, so I, I like, loved it very, very much, I have to admit, your 2019 paper. Uh, it's a, a paper in Scientific American, October 2019, which had the title, if I remember it co correctly, Science is not about getting more likes. And, and, and of course, I, I couldn't agree more with what you stated there, that people are pursuing ideas like supersymmetries and string theory and stuff like that, to which nothing, I mean, literally, there is no evidence for that. Uh, just there's a mathematical appeal, a, a beauty, and that's why people are, are, that's why it is still basically considered mainstream research. And, right. and I, I, I love that paper very much. And I, I, of course, I keep showing it to all my theoretical physicist friends. <laughs> well, but, the, 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 yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah but, but now, now he, he comes the funny part. So is, isn't there some sort of contradiction here? Uh, because, because, well, I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, this, this uh, St Sagan standard that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Now, do you think when you claim that Oumuamua is actually uh, an artificial object, uh, do you think that it, it's not a, not a double standard of some sort, uh, especially coming from you? So please explain this. Not at all, because uh, I argue in, uh, in favor of getting more evidence. And the only way we would not get evidence is if people say, uh, it's always rocks, it's never aliens, give me extraordinary evidence. The point is, you cannot ask for extraordinary evidence without providing the funds, the, the, the moral support. You know, uh, you, you cannot, on the one hand, ridicule the subject and ignore it and push it to the sideways and not fund it. By the way, the search for dark matter, for example, is funded a thousand times more than the search for technological signatures. So without that support, Obviously, you will not get extraordinary evidence because it's just like stepping on the grass and saying, look, the grass doesn't grow. Uh, but my point is broader than that. And uh, I think, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I think science is guided by, should be guided by evidence. And we should collect as much evidence as possible, okay, to guide our imagination. Now, what happens in those other areas is that um, uh, the, the, there is theoretical work done uh, without even a psychological need to get uh, experimental verification. And this has been done for decades now, and it's part of the mainstream. And the reason it's comfortable for a lot of physicists is because they don't put any skin to the game. You know, it's uh, 
kids, when they try to learn about the world, they literally put skin in the game. They get bruised all the time. And the physics is all about making predictions that can be falsified, that can be tested experimentally. So I'm definitely making a prediction that objects similar to Oumuamua may be artificial in origin, which we can check by taking photographs of future objects that look weird. I mean, there is nothing more practical than doing that. And okay. the, I, so I'm, I'm actually standing up to the standard. Now, the other thing I should mention is that uh, it's, I don't think it's an extraordinary claim, first of all, because as I said, uh, the circumstances around us are repeated billions of times in the Milky Way galaxy. And therefore, it's completely mainstream, it's completely common sense to say uh, they are likely to have been out there. I don't know if right now, but they've been in the past billions of years. And let's just check. Let's just look for evidence. This should be the ordinary, not the extraordinary. To claim that something like us is extraordinary is arrogant. Okay, so I think it's yeah. not extraordinary. Second point, extraordinary conservatism, the way advocated by uh, many scientists right now, leads to extraordinary ignorance. Why? Because you are not willing to even look. Okay, and that is the wrong approach. So they just want me to bring an alien that will shake their hand and only then they will say, oh, well, maybe, yes, now it's uh, sufficient proof. Oh, now, at the same time of saying it's not it's not sufficient proof, uh, the mainstream community is not funding the search at all. So you have to understand when they say there is no extraordinary evidence, at the same time, they're suppressing the ability to get such evidence. And so That's my right. point is this frontier should be funded at the level of a billion dollars. Look, gravitational waves in astrophysics, that was ridiculed as a subject for the past few decades. I gave a talk at a winter school about it, and one of the lecturers in that winter school said, why are you wasting the time of these students on a subject that will not be relevant during their careers? And that was 2013. Two years later, the students were still doing their PhD. The LIGO experiment detected the first gravitational waves. And the Nobel Prize was awarded a few years ago for that. Now, that, that is extraordinary. Oh, so my point is, without a billion dollars, we would never reach the sensitivity needed to detect gravitational waves. That subject was ridiculed. Now, at the same time, suppose people would say extraordinary evidence like gravita uh, extraordinary claim like gravitational waves exist, require extraordinary evidence, and they would not give the billion dollars, we would never have that proof, okay? And so my point is, a billion dollars was given, gravitational waves have no effect on our private lives. You know, who cares? Uh, the nature of dark matter has no relevance to our private lives. You know, if, if it's an axion or a weakly interacting massive particle, people's lives will not be affected. But nevertheless, we put those hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars to look for those things. We haven't found the dark matter yet. My point is the answer of whether Oumuamua is a technological relic, the answer to that has a huge impact, if it's a positive answer, on the lives of people, on the way we perceive ourselves in the universe, on our plans for the future, on religious philosophical ideas that we have. It will have, it's the question that has the biggest impact on society. OK, yeah. we are not putting a billion dollars towards that. We are putting towards gravitational waves. We are putting towards uh, uh, dark matter searches. And the subject is also ridiculed by the scientific community. How is that possible when the public cares so much about it and the public funds science? So I tell you right now, there is this unhealthy situation, a subject that is of great interest to the public is being pushed aside by the scientific community, which is funding things that are not at all of interest to the public. That's right. And if I, if I think about, for example, the case of, of New Horizons, which you or, or, or mentioned before, that was practically, as Alan Stern could, could tell anyone, it was really uh, the government wanted to cancel the funding for that spacecraft and, and the public saved it like three times. Or right. something like that. Uh, right. So, so indeed, so I, now I can understand your master plan, and 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 correct me if I'm wrong. That your master plan is that you are stepping out to the public with your your with your book to to convince the taxpayers themselves that this is something. Oh that yeah, you're... they're they're already convinced. The fact that the book yeah. is the bestseller tells you the public has the heart in the right place. It's the scientific community that doesn't have the the and and 
you know, the pushback that I get is mostly from the scientific community. You know, I'm getting an extraordinary response. Like I got a, an email from Malawi from a woman that said that she's interested in becoming an astronomer after reading my book. And I got a, an email this morning from Manchester in, in, in the UK and from the Library of Congress and, you know, people all over the world. <clears throat> and from uh, there was from Columbia yesterday, a, a, an email that from a, a, a graduate student that said that hearing about my work changed her life, you know, uh, a, 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 an undergraduate student, sorry. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm getting a lot of responses from the world, people that are really excited by by uh, the, the prospect. It's just that the scientific community is pushing back. And, you know, it may have to do with uh, a report on unidentified flying objects that uh, are not up to the scientific scrutiny or science fiction literature. But my point about that is if you go back to ancient history, you will find uh, people that argue that the, the human body has a soul and therefore anatomy should not be allowed. And imagine if scientists would say this, the human body is a controversial subject. You know, some people claim it has a soul. Others claim it doesn't. We don't want to discuss it because it's controversial. We want to preserve our image so that we never get into a controversial subject like the human body. Where would modern medicine be? You know, the duty of science is to address subjects of interest to the public that the scientific method can clarify. And we definitely have right now the tools to address this question of whether there are technological uh, civilizations out there. We have the telescopes, we just need to decide to do that. All right, okay. I, I think I think that this is this is fascinating and 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 uh, of course now I, I totally understand your motivation more than before. And and so 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 if I get it correctly, uh, you're not explicitly saying that Oumuamua is in fact an extraterrestrial object. You just say that that please please people out there let's take this option seriously right. at least that much as as for example it was considered at least as much as as for example supersymmetry or or string theory or something like that but because it, actually it, but this subject in difference i have this chapter in my book umwamu's wager which is similar yeah. to the wager that blaise pascal the french philosopher put about god he said, you know, if if God may exist or not exist, he was a very famous mathematician. And, um, and uh, he said, if God exists, the implications are huge. Therefore, we have to take that possibility seriously. And I say the same thing about Umumua being a technological relic. You know, you cannot dismiss this possibility. It will be a big mistake to dismiss the possibility that it's a technological relic up front because of the implications, the huge implications. And all we need to do is collect, you know, it opens up a new window for searching uh, for other civilizations that are not around anymore. And let's use that as a wake up call for us to engage in this search. And I cannot say for sure if it was or was not because not enough data was collected on it, but it definitely didn't look like a comet or an asteroid. And uh, there were a few suggestions other than mine, in the scientific liter literature, trying to explain it as a natural object. And all three of them uh, had major flaws, but in all three of them, there was a suggestion for something that we have never seen before, you know, an object that we have never And so that it or already tells you that it must be unusual, you know, even so if we get more information about it, even if it came from a natural origin, we'll find some insight into nature, some factories had to produce objects like that, that don't look like the objects in the solar system. And it would be interesting to figure it out. Yeah. And, you know, the people suggested maybe it's a hydrogen iceberg, maybe it's a dust cloud, maybe, you know, things like that. And all of them have problems. A hydrogen iceberg would get evaporated very quickly. A dust cloud uh, that is a hundred times less dense than air would get uh, heated by hundreds of degrees as it comes close to the sun and would not maintain its integrity. And there was also a suggestion maybe it's a piece of uh, a bigger object that was um, ripped apart by the tidal force of a star when the object passed close to a star. And the problem with that is that you usually get elongated uh, pieces rather than flat as, the, as Umuamua looked like. So all suggestions involved something that we have never seen before and all of them had major flaws. And I say, given that, that's what we have on the table. You know, the artificial origin is a completely plausible uh, hypothesis to consider and therefore get more data on other objects that look like it. 
That's right. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, and and please, please, listeners out there, go and and purchase the book Extraterrestrial by Professor Avi Leib. And Professor, thank you so much for your time. It and it was indeed a pleasure to have this discussion with you. Thank you.